one do your own Chromebook. You can get it in Zoom. No, I need to go in. I'm afraid that we start talking. Thank you, thank you. So I would win there. Oh. If I throw a paper, I don't want to do paper. I'm on the wrong side. I throw scissors. So this three out of 1234567890. So I win 3 out of 9. Simplify that. You're right. Just helping you understand. It. All right, Mr. Grodick, you think we're ready? There's still a bunch of students to cut that are trying to get in. So I would tell um, teachers, if they reach out to you, just send them the link to the BMS YouTube uh, channel. Okay. Because we can't have, we can't have you know, 30, 40 students. Right. Here. We're still, uh, we have about two or three to bring in. And as okay. they come in, I'll just keep bringing them. To I'll keep okay. Them. Thank you. How many students will you have there? Uh, we're going to have just under 600 students joining us from wow. uh, about 40 classrooms. We've got about 15 students in each classroom. Oh. Um, and actually, it's probably around 13 students in each classroom. We also have students that are uh, learning from home this year, and yes. they are also join, joining us. So we have wow. um, about six, 60 students actually joining us yeah. from home. So you'll see uh, about 40 classrooms and about 60 students. We are going to ask everybody on the call to mute uh, their classrooms and microphones. We're going to get started in about one minute. And will there be questions? Yes, we have uh, questions at the end. Um, we're going to have two questions per grade level, two in eighth grade, seventh grade, and sixth grade. Uh, the students are ready. The teachers are ready. Um, so I should leave so about 15 minutes, would you say, for questions? 15 minutes would be perfect. Good. All right, Bay Middle School, good morning and welcome. What a terrific privilege and honor it is to have Dr. Irene Butter with us this morning via Zoom, speaking to 600 students in 40 classrooms and many of us in our own homes as well. Uh, Dr. Butter, we appreciate you joining us. Uh, for over 30 years, Bay Middle School, Dr. Butter has been sharing her Holocaust stories to middle school students, high school students in the United States, Israel, Germany, across the world. And her goal is to share the lessons that she's learned uh, for us to also understand the gravity of genocide, develop appreciation of freedom and uh, human rights and motivate us as students, as staff to stand up against hatred, prejudice and racism. She's had incredible amount of awards and they are but one indicator of many of the profound impact she's had on the lives of others and specifically students. We're incredibly honored to have her join us today. I'm going to pass the screen and microphone to Dr. Butter at this time. We'll have an opportunity for questions at the end. Thank you, Bay Middle School. Dr. Butter, welcome. 
Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I've been looking forward to coming to your school. Okay. Well, it's a pleasure I to have well, it's a pleasure to have you and we are ready. Thank you. Good. Well, my story is that of a Holocaust survivor as a child growing up in Nazi occupied Europe. And what I first want to do is to show you a map of my journey. Next slide, please. So this shows you all the places that I was forced to move to uh, as, as a child from early childhood till I came to the U United States of America at age 15. I was born in Berlin, Germany, and um, I'll fill in the facts. Uh, we were forced to leave Germany and um, settled in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, then because of Nazi occupation of the Netherlands and persecution of the Jews, my family and I were de deported to Camp Westerbork, which was a concentration camp in the Netherlands. From there, we were deported to a concentration camp in German called Bergen-Belsen. And then uh, barely surviving after one year, we were, we had the fortune to be included in a prisoner exchange. And so um, our train stopped in a small town um, in Germany called Biberach. Then the prisoner exchange took place at the border of Germany and Switzerland. And then I'll fill in all the details, but from Switzerland, I was deported to a refugee camp in Algiers. And um, having stayed there for almost one year, I came to America by myself at age 15 to start a new life. So you get an idea of the journey and none of this was by free will. We, my parents didn't choose to leave our homeland, Germany, to go to the Netherlands. Then of course, deportation to concentration camp was forced. Um, then we came to uh, Switzerland and I was forced to leave and deported to a refugee camp in North Africa. So it was only when I came to America that I had the freedom to choose where I wanted to travel and where I wanted to live. So now I will start with giving you a little background about my family. So this is a wedding picture of my parents in Berlin Germany. The next slide. I grew up with one brother. He was two years older than I. And um, we, this is a picture when we were little kids. I grew up with very loving parents and also my grandparents living in the same house. And um, we were spoiled. It was a very loving childhood, a, a wonderful family. We were comfortable. We were assimilated as Jews into German society until the Nazis um, came into power. Now, this is an, another picture of my father, myself. I was, I was five years old at that time and I adored my father, he was always loving, he was funny, he was playful. He gave me a lot of attention. Uh, and so I have only wonderful me memories about my childhood. The next slide, please. So here's a picture of my grandparents that I grew up with. 
my grandmother holding me as a baby and my grandfather holding my brother when he was a baby. So um, what happened when Hitler came to power um, started persecution of the Jews. Jews were considered an inferior race and they had to be gotten rid of because they would contaminate the German people. And so the goal of Hitler was to eliminate Jews from the entire world, at least from the entire continent of Europe. And my grandfather owned a bank. My father was partner in the bank. And when the bank was taken away because Jews could no longer own banks, he became unemployed and he left Germany to find work in the Netherlands. Not only to find work, but also because he thought it might be a way to escape the persecution. So he was able to find a job in Amsterdam with the American Express Company. And we were able to follow my mother, my brother and I, and this is the house where we lived in Amsterdam. And on the right hand side is the house of Anna Frank. Some of you may have heard about her. She wrote a diary that's one of the most read books in the entire world after the Bible. Uh, and um, we lived in the same neighborhood. Her family also came from Germany to escape Hitler. Um, the next slide, please. So this is a typical picture that was taken in school, in public school. And Anna Frank and I did not go to the same school, but it's a very similar picture, sitting at a desk with a pen in the hand and a notebook, and then some picture behind as the background. So we spent two years in the Netherlands, which were happy, relatively peaceful, but then the Nazi invaded the country and the persecution of the Jews escalated. And gradually, most Jews who either couldn't leave the country or find a hiding place were deported. I think 120,000 Jews were deported from Holland and not a very large number of them came back after the war. So when the Nazis occupied Holland, life became very difficult. Um, freedoms were taken away. Uh, we had curfews. We weren't allowed in public places like movies, museums, swimming pools. We weren't allowed to take public transportation. Uh, our bicycles were confiscated and not being able to take public transportation and not having a bicycle just confined us uh, a great deal because every place you wanted to go to, you had to walk. And so, my father one day met a friend and he had just received Ecuadorian passports from a man in Sweden for himself and his wife. And he told my father um, the name of the person that had provided the passports. And so my, what my father did was um, sent a letter right away with passport pictures um, asking for Ecuadorian passports. So this is what they looked like. And um, for some strange reason, a passport picture had to have the left ear exposed. I'd never heard a reason for that and I've never seen it again, but this is how it was then. The next slide, please. So here you see a sign of Jews forbidden. This, this was the largest park in Amsterdam where many people visited for all kinds of reasons, um, recreation, walking, sitting in the sun and so on. 
for Jews, it was forbidden. Next slide. We had other restrictions. We were not allowed to go visit friends who were not Jewish and people who were not Jewish weren't allowed to visit us. And um, life became more and more difficult as time went on. Uh, we couldn't go to the grocery store until after three o'clock, but it was wartime and there were many restrictions and scarcities. And so after three o'clock, often there wasn't much food left. We had a curfew, had to be in the house every night at um, seven o'clock. And then the worst of it all was the deportation. The Nazis tried to deport all Jews. So the, the first slide that you saw, um, could you go back one? Now, this is a picture of how, how the Nazis deported Jews. They would kind of block off an entire neighborhood, uh, barricades, Everybody was supposed to go off the streets into the houses. And then they would go from house to house, from door to door and look for Jews. And they would give us 10 minutes to pack our belongings, the belongings that we had chosen to take with us. And then we would be marched to a, a gathering place and so you see all these people, elderly people and babies and baby carriages and lots of luggage that people were um, taking with them because you could only take what you could carry. And um, this became the process that they were using. Um, eventually they came to our house and this is what happened, 10 minutes and you had to get out of there. Now the next slide shows the train, which the kind of trains that were used to transport Jews to concentration camps. You see it's a cattle car and each of these wagons, they would push in 60 or 70 people uh, crammed together like sardines in a can not even enough room for everybody to sit on the floor. Some people had to sit on each other's laps. And when the tr train was filled, the cars were filled, then they would lock those doors and there would be no water, no food, no air, because it didn't have windows. And that's how people were deported to the concentration camps. In our own case, we were deported to Besterborg, which was about six, six to seven hours on a very hot day in June. Uh, we were deported in these, these kinds of trains, but many people who were sent to Auschwitz or other death camps in Europe had to be in these cars for days and without water and air, uh, people died even before getting to the concentration camp. So in our case, um, we landed in Vesterborg in the evening. Um, it was a very hot day. Uh, we were put into the barracks. And this gives you some idea of what this camp looked like. On the left side, you see the barracks. And on the right side, you see the beds. And we were assigned to two beds. Uh, it was a three tier bunk bed, steel frame, and there was a straw mattress. And that's all that was given to you. You could use one third of the space under the bed to store your belongings. And that was it. And so of course, as you can imagine, life became frustrating. Adults had to work some kind of work. Um, Children my age didn't have any schooling. Uh, there weren't any books, there weren't, weren't any um, crayons or, or pencils or notebooks or any kind of supplies. Life was extremely boring. 
My brother had a job. He was older, two years older. He became a messenger and carried messengers from places, different places in the camp. He was given a bicycle of which he was very proud. And um, we had three meals a day. The food wasn't the way my mother cooked at home, but it, it, it wasn't terrible. It was edible. And um, quantities were not adequate. Most people lost weight, but it was considerably better than what happened later on. Now, what I remember most about this camp is that every Saturday afternoon, a train came in. This is talking about Vesterborg. A, a cattle car train came and the railroad, the, the railway tracks went smack through the center of the camp and the train would sit there all the all this couple several days till Monday morning, Saturday afternoon, all day Sunday, all day all day Monday, Tuesday morning. So Monday night, the barrack leaders would turn on the lights and they would read off the names of the people who had to go on the train. And most of the time the train went to Auschwitz. Several hundred people would leave every Tuesday morning. And then the cycle uh, started all over again. And you began to, if you were lucky, you didn't have to go on that train. You started worrying about the next week because every week this train came in. That's the, mo the biggest memory I have still from Westerbork. If our names were not on the list and we would go and visit with other friends or or um, relatives and see who was going to leave. And so the passports that I mentioned before arrived in Westerbork. They didn't arrive before we were deported. And because of that, our status in, in Westerbork changed. We were no longer just ordinary Jews. We became exchange Jews. And these were Jews that the Nazis wanted to keep alive because they wanted to exchange us for other people more valuable to the, to the German country. So here you see picture of Bergen-Belsen. The, the previous picture shows uh, what we saw when we arrived in Bergen-Belsen. We had been told that Bergen-Belsen would be a better camp than Westerbork, but upon arrival seeing these these emaciated people with frightened, sad expressions on their face. Everything looked very dreary there. And that was just the first images we saw upon arrival. The barracks you see are very similar to the barracks that we inhabited um, in Westerbork. Next slide. <clears throat> so here we are in Bergen-Belsen and you can see what the beds were like because as the camp became more and more crowded, two people had to share a bed, which is just a narrow bunk bed with two people. Uh, the conditions in, in Bergen-Belsen were unbearable. Adults had to work, most of them outside of the camp, get up every morning very early they had to have um, um, assembly. They had to be counted every day before leaving the camp and going to their workplaces, which most of them were hard slave labor. They didn't come back until evening time. And at work, there was no food. Uh, many of the jobs were outdoors and um, Others were in factory, factories and um, other places of hard labor. Um, the food rations were minimal. All we got was a piece of bread about two inches wide, which had to last the whole day. Then there was a meal in the evening, which consisted of turnips, boiled 
in water. And that's what they served almost every single night. Um, the hygienic conditions were terrible. We lived in these barracks. They were public bathrooms and outdoors, out houses for going to the toilet and um, little opportunity to wash your clothes or wash yourselves. I, I think we got in one, almost one year, we had a shower uh, two or three times. That, that was all that was offered in a different building. Um, infectious diseases were rampant and there were several epidemics of uh, typhus, cholera, um, polio, pneumonia, dysentery. Uh, these infections just spread very quickly. And it was the people were sick all the time. My father had pneumonia um, early in our stay in Bergen Belsen. I think he probably never recovered from that because there were no drugs, no medications, no treatment. There was a hospital, but um, all that it provided is that you didn't have to go to work and you could rest. The, the other um, transmitter of disease were lice. We all had but body lice. There was no way of escaping them. And of course, they transmitted the diseases. So that when a disease began, it became epidemic. Uh, and no vaccinations of any kind, uh, no drugs, really. So many people in Bergen-Belsen died. And uh, towards the end, we were there almost a year, more than 11 months. And uh, more and more people came, became more and more crowded. The food rations became more limited. And um, at night, when I went to bed, I was just hoping that I would wake up alive the next morning because every morning I woke up, I was surrounded. Um, with dead bodies. So then um, we were sent there to be exchanged for German uh, citizens or German prisoners. And this didn't happen until almost one year. And um, we were um, struggling to stay alive. But then one day they announced that the people who had South American passports um, needed to um, be screened by, by a German physician um, for being included in this transport, which would be leaving soon. And by some miracle, my family was included in this group of 300 people. There were in several thousand people in Bergen-Belsen with these passports. So it, it, I always call it a miracle that my family was included because my parents at that point were very sick. And um, yet we made it, some, some people helped um, my parents get to the train. And when we got there, or maybe we could see the next slide. the train to freedom. Now this is a picture that um, students made. Um, when we got to the train station, uh, we saw a Red Cross train and that really um, increased our hope that we were going to be freed. It was our liberation because most of the time the Nazis didn't, didn't have access to Red Cross trains. So that was um, hopeful. Uh, then when we entered the, the um, train, we were served hot stews. Uh, we were told that we could take off our Star of David. I forgot to mention that um, part of the deportation scheme was that we all had to wear Stars of David on our clothing on the left side of our shoulder. And we had to wear these all the all these years, even in the camps. And when we 
boarded this Red Cross train. They told us we, we could rip off our stars. So that was another sign of encouragement because basically you never knew where you were going. The Nazis might say they're taking you one place and you ended up in another concentration camp. So um, this was all very hopeful. And um, we almost couldn't believe that the four of us as a family managed to get out of this hell. Uh, but then sadly, two days later, my father died on the train. Uh, and um, the, probably the cause of his death was um, starvation uh, and malnutrition, but also the day before we left, he was badly beaten at work by one of the Nazis. And um, we don't know what that beating uh, did to his body, but he died on the train. That was a tremendous shock um, that we were so close to freedom and he didn't make it. And my mother had been ill for months before that and it actually was bedridden and I was taking care of her and some friends carried her to the train or she wouldn't have been able to make it even. So she was the one my brother and I worried about most, but um, we lost my father. And then um, the next, well, this is kind of a, a drawing of, uh, we got to this town called Biberach and um, he, his remains were taken off the train and put on a bench. And uh, my mother, my brother and I had no choice but to, to continue the journey on this train because here we were still in Germany and we weren't going to survive. So then from there, um, we were on the train and this is just a list of people who were uh, selected to be part of this group to be exchanged. Next slide. And so, yeah, the, the way the story continues, we arrive in Switzerland and my mother and my brother were very ill. They were sent to the hospital immediately from the train station of a town in Switzerland called St. Gallen. And um, I was then 14 years old and I wasn't allowed to stay with my family. Uh, the Swiss claimed they had too many refugees and um, all the people in this group from Bergen-Belsen were sent to a refugee camp in, in North Africa. A few other people died on the train besides my father. And um, so here we were separated from my family, not only by city, but on another continent. This was even before the war ended. So for several months, we didn't have any connection. There was no mail, no way of communication until I received a telegram one day that they were recovering. And after the war ended in May of 1945, we were able to correspond regularly and hoping for reunification, but that, that never happened. Um, I, I was hoping that either I could be sent to Switzerland to be with them or that they could come to the camp in North Africa, but um, it didn't happen. And so here you see a picture of the camp. The barracks were quite different. Um, a group of people sitting there in the, in the picture on the left, um, friends and others. And um, in the front row, there is um, a man who was our teacher. He taught us French and a little English because most of us were headed for the United States. And then on his right is his son, on his left is his daughter. And we became close friends. 
in the camp and on, we over on the right, that's me. And the other picture again shows a number of friends uh, with a British shoulder, soldier who befriended us. He was stationed um, in North Africa and sometimes took us to the movies. So this is um, um, the, the camp and uh, we had freedom. We could leave any time. The camp was situated on a hill and walking down the hill, there was a beautiful beach of the Mediterranean and I learned to swim there. Uh, we could go to the nearby town called Philipville and go to the movies or to a market or life certainly was considerably improved from Bergen-Belsen. But the problem was I was alone, separated from my family and longing to be back with them. So um, eventually in December of 1945, uh, well, first of all, we had relatives in the United States who were, who provided an uh, affidavit, which you needed to get a visa to come to come to America and that took a long time to achieve. And then there was no transportation uh, because um, the war ended and all the soldiers were transported back to America before Christmas. So of course that was understandable, but eventually in uh, December, a Liberty ship became available. They took either men or women, they didn't take families and this is the ship that um, took me um, to America. And then on the ship, I think there were 15 women uh, of our group that um, boarded this ship. And we spent 21 days on the turbulent ocean in December. And there was a doctor on the ship, American doctor. One night he told us, that these ships sometimes break in half. And I didn't really believe him until I found this picture on top there, which shows a ship that broke in half. But luckily um, our ship arrived um, 21 days later at the harbor of Baltimore, uh, which was frozen. So there were no end of obstacles in this journey. Uh, we couldn't dock because of ice and eventually an icebreaker came and made it possible for us to come nearer to the dock. And then we, we were, we debarked from the ship in um, safety boats, uh, just let down uh, into the water and then uh, rode a little motor boats to, to the dock. So I arrived there um, and um, stayed with relatives in New York for some time. And yeah, we could move on to the next slide. Uh, went to school immediately. This is my graduation from high school picture. I went to high school for two and a half years. And then the picture on the right shows I, um, uh, we had no money, we were penniless when we came to this country. We didn't have a home, we didn't have money and we didn't have citizenship. We were stateless because Hitler took away citizenship from all the, all Jews. So um, starting a new life, once my mother and my brother came six, six months later. So we were separated for 18 months um, and then reunited and um, living together in New York City. Uh, my brother and I both finished high school first and then went to college and um, had an opportunity to go to university, to graduate school. Um, next slide. So um, in graduate school, I went to U Duke University and earned a PhD in economics. And this is where I met my husband, who was also a graduate student there. Um, we started a family. That's the 
Next picture. Two children, a daughter and a son. This is when they were little. Now they have their own families. So we can move on to the next picture. Two granddaughters and, and a grandson. And now at this point, I have two great grandchildren, a boy two years old and a little girl six months old. So um, America and its freedom and its opportunities allowed me to start a family, um, a education, a career, and um, a, a very rich life. The next, next slide. So this is a picture of me teaching economics at the University of Michigan, where my husband and I both taught for more than 35 years. And so we are both retired now and still live in Ann Arbor, same town as the university. Next slide. This is sort of a historical picture. I was teaching at the University of Michigan in the School of Public Health. And this is graduation day. And we see all the graduates in their suits and white shirts and ties. In front are the students and in back are the faculty. And over on the right, you, you see me. And I'm the only woman in the department. Now, that was quite a few years ago. These days, it, most likely half of the faculty would be women and more than half of the students would, would be woman, women also. So times have changed since the 1970s a great deal. And, and that's why I show this, this picture. This is not the present world. Next, next slide. So um, one time, my brother also had two children and we had a family union at one point and our children wanted us to take them back to Europe to um, see the sites of family history. So we went to Berlin, we went to Amsterdam, we went to Westerbork, Bergen-Belsen and, and also to Biberach, which is place where my father's buried. So this is the first picture. The next one, please. Showing you Bergen-Belsen existed from, um, well, anyway, this is just a sign at the entrance asking people to respect the peace and quiet of the dead buried there. And the next picture, you see a mass grave, and this is what happened when the Allies liberated Bergen-Belsen in April of 1945. There were dead bodies all over, and the only way they could bury them was in mass graves, and that's one of them. And if you were to visit the grounds, the memorial grounds now, you would see a number of these graves um, listing the number of people that are buried there. Next slide. It's um, a stone dedicated to Anna Frank. Anna Frank and her sister died in Bergen-Belsen after they were sent there from Auschwitz. And um, people have put up these markers. Of course, they would also be buried in a mass grave, but some people uh, came back later and um, installed these gravestones and you see people visit there and they leave a lot of mementos, jewelry or little dolls or stones. Next slide. And here we are at the cemetery where my father is buried. The, the one on the left, it's my brother, my son and my brother's two children and the other the other picture is uh, my daughter and one granddaughter, and the other one was too, too little that time to go there. So this is the cemetery I visited about 
um, half a dozen times and made friends with the caretakers of the cemetery. And maybe I'll have a chance to go back once, once more, but at least the children and grandchildren um, have a place to visit if they want to um, explore their ancestry. So next slide. Um, so this is my one example of my piece work at the University of Michigan. We have a Raoul Wallenberg lecture series and Raoul Wallenberg was, a, he is a Swede and he came to the University of Michigan to study in the 19, 1931 to 35. And um, he is a hero of World War II. He saved many, many Jews in Hungary at the end of the war and then was captured by the Russians and never seen or heard of again. And so I helped establish this endowment so that we have a Wallenberg lecturer, a speaker once a year who is a role model because of his courage and his sacrifice to save other people. He wasn't a Jew but he dedicated his life to saving as many Jews as possible. And so by now we've had, um, I think uh, tw 25 or 26 lecturers. They're all humanitarians um, who exemplify courage. And, um, and the, the theme of the project is one person can make a difference. And that was Raoul Wallenberg. Next slide. And I have also the, the co-founder. Oh, well, that's when the Dalai Lama came. He was one of the Wallenberg lectures. Each lecture received a medal. And this was the visit of the Dalai Lama. Next slide. And here are some of the other medalists. Uh, Meet please. She was a person took care of the Frank family who were hiding in Amsterdam uh, during the war. And um, uh, the, the person on the right is Rusa Bajina. He was the hero of Rwanda who saved a lot of people in Rwanda during that war there. And um, then um, it, there are other Wallenberg Medal recipients from that project. Next slide. I helped found um, a group in Ann Arbor um, of pal six Jewish and six Palestinian women who work for peace. And we're now about um, oh, almost 20 years old meeting every other week. We used to meet every other week in our homes and we're a dialogue group, talk, discuss difficult topics. But now with COVID, we meet on Zoom. And uh, so that gives us a chance to still keep, keep up our relationships. But we're looking forward to um, meeting in our homes again, where we always have a wonderful meal starting before our discussions. Next slide. Well, this is my memoir that I wrote, um, published in, in 2018, and it's called Shores Beyond Shores. It gives a lot of details of the story and um, the experiences and lessons that I learned from um, this journey that I have described to you. And so my, what I usually like to say to students is never be a bystander when you see things that are wrong or that don't conform to your values or they're mean or they're in, unjust, then don't turn your back, but um, make a difference. And so the other, um, thought is that each of us can make a difference. Even one person can
can make a difference. And sometimes the problems seem so large and we think we can't do anything about it, but that isn't true, that you can take action. Uh, you can interrupt, you know, for example, in schools, sometimes there's a lot of bullying and you don't turn your back, but you try to interrupt, you confront the bullier or you become an ally of the person that's being bullied or you look for support. And um, once you start interrupting something, you may find out that you have a following. Each person can make a difference. And then also refusing to be enemies. Uh, that's the motto of, of my group of Jewish and Palestinian women that um, often uh, we are told that somebody is an, an enemy, a target group that people don't like. And it's important to follow your own values and try to meet people, look into their faces and hear their stories. And often you find out that person is, is not an enemy. The person may have, there may be a difference but um, the commonalities that we all have as human beings outweigh our differences and um, diversity makes life a lot richer. And so hope we have some time for questions. I took a little longer than I planned to, but um, I'd love to hear the questions. Thank you, Dr. Butter. Uh, incredible story. We uh, sincerely appreciate it. Uh, any questions from eighth grade for Dr. Butter? I have one for Mrs. Budzig, um, Mrs. Budzig's class. It says, uh, what positive and negative emotions did you experience after liberation? How long did they stay with you? Yeah, that, that is a good question. You know, uh, I experienced liberation when I was in the refugee camp in, in North Africa. And um, I really couldn't feel much joy because I was alone. That was one reason. And, um, you know, it, it was too soon to overcome all the, the pain and the suffering and the losses experience. Now, I know in the camp, they try to have a celebration, but I, I did not even participate. Now, of course, it was a tremendous joy and a, a tremendous um, change, change of tides, but it's complicated. Uh, it takes time to be ready for joy. Thank you. Um, any questions from seventh grade? I have a question from our class, Mr. Redditario. Um, what was your biggest fear and how did you overcome it? Well, the, the biggest fear is death and loss. My family was allowed to be together the whole time, but as my parents became sicker and sicker in the camp, uh, that was the biggest fear that one of, one of us or all of us would not make it, would die, would never get out of this camp. We have another question from Mr. Fitzpatrick's class. Hi, I am Ollie Brown. And so my question is, what are the most important lessons that our generation should learn from your story? Uh, can you repeat that? I didn't quite understand. What are the most important lessons that our generation should learn from your story? Well, I, I would repeat, never be a bystander. You know, we all have to develop a social conscience. We have to protect each other as people respect each other, protect each other, and fight for human dignity for everybody. And so it, it means to be an active citizen, to have moral values 
ethical values and um, live our lives as um, participating citizens. Now we have learned that our democracy cannot be taken for granted and everyone must work to protect it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, how about two more questions? Uh, let's go to sixth grade. We have one. Go ahead, Max. What was one of the most surprising things that ever happened at a concentration camp? Surprising. Hmm. Well, I think I knew a lot about it even before I got there. But maybe the most surprising thing was the prisoner exchange because we were sent to that camp to be exchanged. And almost a year went by before that happened. So we didn't believe in it anymore. We were just stuck there and uh, exchange was an illusion. And when finally the announcement came that people were going to be selected uh, for this exchange, I think that was a big surprise. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I have a question, um, but first of all, uh, thank you for speaking with us today. Um, in class, we learned that in 1945, you were moved to a camp in Algeria where you met a young Polish boy named Vitek. What do you remember about your relationship with him? And were you able to keep in touch with him over the years? Hmm. That's a surprising question. <laughs> yes, I, I did um, see what happened was that we came to, uh, to this camp, Philipville, and many of the adults, the parents of children were quite sick. And so they kind of made up uh, some barracks and uh, treated them as a hospital. And the children were all put into one house together with the house mother. And then gradually as the parents recovered, they all were um, living with their parents in little, little apartments in the barrack. But Vitek and I were the only two children that didn't have parents there. And uh, Vitek, was um, about five years old and he, it, it was said and, and probably true, he saw his parents being shot in, in front of his own eyes. And he was quite disturbed. I mean, every night he would have nightmares and, and wake up screaming. And um, so he was alone, he, he had nobody and um, so I became very close to him and um, uh, gave him love and attention and cuddling and so on. And then um, the, because there were only two kids left in that house, they um, placed him with, a, a, he was Polish, with a Polish family. And he and I didn't have a common language even. Uh, so he was living with a Pol Polish family. And um, uh, they also, uh, I don't know where they went, uh, whether they went back to Poland or um, somewhere else. And I lost contact. So I, n I never saw him again. And uh, I now, this many years later, I, I feel sorry that I couldn't keep in touch with him. But um, I think I was able to show him some protection and give him love. Dr. Butter, uh, your, your story is inspirational. Um, Uh, we can't thank you enough. It's, uh, it's very personal to consider students 
our age and your experience at the same age, maybe even younger and going through something uh, similar. And many of us probably do have challenges in our lives that uh, your presentation opportunity with us today inspires us to never be a bystander, to stand up when we see something wrong, uh, that one person can make a difference. Dr. Butter, I, I have to believe that your impact on VTech's life, even without a common language, is significant and impacted his life for, for the remainder of his time. And to, to refuse to be an enemy, those are three things uh, that Bay Middle School, our students, our staff, we will take with us uh, from you. We're very appreciative of that. Uh, we thank you for your time. Bay Middle School, I did have a chance to read Dr. Butter's book, Shores Beyond Shores. I highly recommend it, especially after having this wonderful opportunity to meet Dr. Butter and hear from her. Once again, Dr. Butter, thank you. We're incredibly impacted. This conversation will continue at Bay Middle School beyond this hour that we've had with you. We wish you nothing but the best. And once again, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate having come, having been there. Too bad it's Zoom, but Zoom is better than nothing. Yeah, I, we, we totally agree. And maybe someday we will be able to meet you in person. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Better. Thank, Thank you, Bay you. Middle School. Thank you for the good questions. I appreciate the questions. Thank you and have a great day. Thanks a lot.